I'm introducing Bill, but since I did it last last spring as well, and many of you, if not most of you, were here for that. And since he said, don't, <laughs> don't you dare go on about me, I won't. Um, all I'm going to say is this, that we've been close friends since we met in a hot, muddy place called Chow Duck 68, 1968, which is before your time, some of you. Um, and we've been friends since. Bro's gone on to be a college president at two different colleges, very good ones. And he's a writer and a teacher and a fantastic man. I've been admiring this guy for 48 years. Here he is. Well, that was good and short. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's great to be here um, and to see many of you again. Thank you for having me back. When I was here last time, I don't remember how the topic came up, but it, it, it came to be known that I had been working on a book about uh, the painter Cezanne and the philosopher Merleau-Ponty, and someone, maybe Peter, said, why don't you come back and talk about that? So here I am. Um, I was able to mix this with a, with a visit to um, Tri-C uh, College, uh, and we had a wonderful morning there. Some of you were there. Thank you for coming to that as well. And now this is, has nothing to do with my job. This is only about uh, this sort of ongoing interest that I've had in uh, these people that I'll talk a, a very bit about. So let's drop right into this. Uh, I have a lot of pictures to show you because this is all visual material. And the topic that I uh, gave to this uh, presentation at Cezanne and the Landscapes of, of Provence, uh, you'll see why in a couple of minutes. Um, but this is a shot, as some of you might know, of Cezanne's great obsession, Mont saint Victoire. This is taken from the site above his last studio uh, that he had in his lifetime, above the city of X. Has anybody been to this site? Yes, a couple of people have been to this site. So uh, this is a picture, by the way, that I took uh, three years ago. And uh, you'll see a number of pictures uh, that I took. This is a painting. This is one of Cezanne's very late landscapes taken, uh, painted on that site. And he did about 15 of these late, uh, exact uh, motifs, as he called them, uh, from that site, and uh, it was it was one of the great uh, motifs that Cezanne pursued during his life. I got into this, and I started to think seriously about Cezanne because of this person. Uh, this is the, a picture of the French philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty, uh, 1909 to 1961. Um, Merleau-Ponty, as you know, if you read the homework. I won't test you on this. Uh, Meloponti was a very well-known, very important French phenomenologist and existentialist. He was a colleague of Sartre's and uh, a very famous French philosopher in his own right. Uh, didn't live very long, you can see. Uh, died in 1961 as a fairly young man still. But he loved painting, wrote a lot about painting, and he wrote a lot about Cézanne. And this is a, a, a wonderful um, portrait of Cezanne. This is currently in the Phillips Gallery. It's one of their um, important Cezannes. I think this is the best self-portrait that he did. But Cezanne uh, was born in 1839 in Aix and died in Aix in 1906. And for me, the connections between these two people revolve around, partly around Merleau-Ponty's writings about Cezanne. Some of you read La Duc de Cezanne, uh, which was the earliest thing he wrote in 1948 about Cezanne. He returned to Cezanne in painting in a beautiful essay. It was written in the summer right before he died, called L'Oi et l'Esprit, Eye and Mind, in English, uh, published in 1960. He died six months later of a massive heart attack in his study in Paris at the age of 54. Uh, Merleau-Ponty wrote that essay in a little village just to the east of Aix called Le Tolonne, which was also one of the sites uh, where Cezanne did some of his greatest painting. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you some landscapes that were done in Le Tolonne. But Merleau Ponty went there in June of 1960. He spent the summer there uh, in 1960, went back to Paris, published this essay, and then as I say, died just a few months later. I have concluded that the key to understanding Merleau Ponty is understanding his views on painting, and the key to his understanding his views on painting is Cezanne. 
So that is the way I got to Cezanne. And what I want to show you now, because a part of my work has been visiting the motifs where Cezanne painted, because my view of Cezanne is that everything is wrapped up in the particular landscape where he was born and to which he returned so many times in his painting. So when I was there two years ago on a sabbatical, I spent a lot of time banging around the countryside looking at these motifs where he actually did this work. And so I'm going to show you uh, some sights and sounds, not sounds, sights from his motifs. Le Stac, Gardin, the Art River, X, Mont-Saint-Victoire, and Le Talonet. I have too many slides, I'll warn you already. So I'm going to go pretty fast. If you want me to stop, just raise your hand and I'll stop. And then maybe we can talk a little bit at the end about this. So all of these sites are in southern France, near Marseille. You see Marseille down there at the bottom. Have people been to Marseille? Great. So these are just north of Marseille. L'Estac is now actually a part of Marseille. I'll come back to them in a minute. The, the small town of the Gardanne. And then these cluster of sites right around Aix, Le Talonnet, the Chateau Noir, Mont Saint Victoire, the Jardin Buffon, Mont Brion. And um, so you can see they're all clustered in that um, part. Uh, the earliest site in terms of you know, his most dramatic landscape painting was the time that he pent, pent in, in Le Stac, uh, which is right on the coast, was then in 1870 when he first went there, a small fishing village north of Marseille. Uh, now it is actually a part of Marseille. This is the house that Cezanne lived in uh, during that period of time. And it is um, a, a quite important site for Cezanne fanatics like myself. You can see he painted there several times between 1870 and 1882, lived in this house where he created these uh, important uh, canvases. Uh, in 1870, by the way, the first time he went there, Cezanne was running from the draft. You, some of you historians will know that 1870 was the time of the Paris Commune uh, and the, the Great Revolution in Paris that was occasioned by the war with Prussia and the loss uh, of, of, of the war to Prussia. And there was a massive uprising. The draft went into overdrive to recruit people both to the war and to the to the to the Paris Commune, or to uh, problems caused by the Paris Commune. Cezanne was drafted uh, nominally, at least. He was living in Aix uh, in his father's house, uh, which I'll show you in a minute. And he had absolutely no interest in going into the army. So he hid in his father's house while the police came and looked for him. And then when they couldn't find him and darkness descended, he walked. He walked to Le Stock and he hid out in Le Stock for almost a year. His early can these are pretty early canvases in, in, in Cezanne's work, but you can see this uh, early, um, a little bit rough rendering of the Bay of Marseille uh, from Le Stock. He kept painting these uh, motifs, as he called them, these scenes in Le Stock. Uh, this is a, a, a little bit later uh, during the, the second passage in Le Stock, and it's a highly impressionistic um, painting for a while. Cezanne thought he was an impressionist, but he moved on, and you can see here some of the qualities of his later painting begin to emerge, these highly geometrical forms, uh, which he became uh, famous for and which influenced so many people, including the uh, Impressionists. This is a, a look looking a bit north from the hills above Le Stock. And this is a picture of that motif that I took in 2013 when I spent a number of days in Le Stock uh, thinking about uh, what Cezanne had been doing there. Le Stock is a beautiful uh, place uh, for many reasons, but one of the most important reasons is these incredible geometric forms of the buildings there. And many other painters after Cezanne went to, went to Le Stock, including Monet, uh, Georges Braque, I'll show you a canvas of his, but these extraordinary um, shapes and colors uh, that are uh, all throughout the village combined with these extraordinary landscapes and these um, these beautiful forms that come out of the, the garrigue, as they call it French, in, in um, in that part of Provence. So I was fascinated by these shapes as many of the painters have been. And I could see why so many people uh, liked to go to Le Stock to paint, including Georges Braque. This is a canvas from 
sometime around 1916. And you can see, if you think back to that image I showed you of, of the houses that Lisa Cezanne painted, um, that kind of cubist sort of rendering of things is beginning to show up in Brock's painting, uh, very much following Cezanne. And here's another um, <coughs> image from a later painting by Brock, also from those stock. And you can kind of follow the development of cubism out of Cezanne into these painters. This is a beautiful canvas of Cezanne's, and you can see some of the ways in which Brock and Picasso uh, might have been looking at Cezanne. This is painted in, a, in the 18, early 1880s above, above Le Stock, a gorgeous, incredible painting. Le Stock is now a very tough town. Um, it is part of Marseille. It's the 15th arrondissement of Marseille, and it is a pretty gnarly place. It is no longer the... Uh, a pastoral village that um, Cezanne uh, knew, and, it, and part of the book that I'm working on is also a, a, a sort of a, a visitation of these communities now, as opposed to when Cezanne painted in them. And um, it's a very interesting, tough, kind of gnarly seaport town uh, with lots of crime. Um, the, just from this site, uh, I used to come down here and have lunch a lot. And a couple of days after we were here, my wife and I were here, there was a, there was a murder on the street, uh, not during broad daylight, but 10 o'clock at night. And the problem has become so severe that this, this was taken from an article from the paper Le Monde. Um, they have these drones now to uh, observe uh, parts of Marseille, including Le Stac, because the crime there, are mostly fueled by drug-related uh, conflicts and gangs. Uh, has become so bad. So one of the things I'm interested in in this book is the changes that have taken place in these landscapes uh, since Cezanne's time and what kind of communities there are now, which will be part of, of the book. Another place where Cezanne spent a lot of time between Les Stock and X is the village of Gaudan. This is the most famous painting from his time in Gaudan. You can see there the, the cubist, sort of proto-cubist kind of um, forms coming out in Cezanne's painting. This is a, a really famous and beautiful painting uh, of Gaudin. Uh, this is the house in Gaudin that Cezanne lived in when he was uh, there. You can see now there's a, um, there's a hair salon below it and some kind of bank. Um, like Le Stac, Gaudin has become a pretty tough place and it is most notably, the home of a huge aluminum factory. This is a picture that I took from one of the high points in town. Um, and also has very dramatic sort of shapes in, in, in contrast to, or maybe in complementary to the shapes that Cezanne was so interested in, which is, of course, all of these roofs and the kind of cubist uh, potential that they had for Cezanne. It's also the site now of the largest coal burning power plant in France. It is partly because this part of France turns out had a lot of coal that they were just discovering when Cezanne uh, was living there. And um, he didn't obviously see these, these, these landscapes as they are now, uh, but I, I, I like to think that he would have painted them just the way he painted the rest of the landscape if he had been able to see them. This is a very tough working class community. It has a very prominent uh, communist party uh, presence, not so true in, in the rest of France anymore, but this is a really tough working class town um, that has obviously been marked by its industrial history. It's also a place that celebrates, as all these places do, the, the passage that Cezanne uh, had, uh, in this case, for a couple of years in Gardin in the early 1880s. And there are various paths you can take to see the motifs that he painted in and this one in particular is important because it led to these images, the first one I showed you, and for this one, this painting, and I finished painting of the same motif. And this is a picture of that motif about the time that Cezanne painted it. And this is a picture that I took in 2013 of the same site. Um, so you can kind of imagine Cezanne going there now and painting that motif in, in very much the same way, but looking in other directions, you see very different kinds of things. Cezanne uh, was fascinated by the ritual of bathing and swimming in his letters uh, that he wrote as a young man to Emile Zola, his famous and uh, dear boyhood friend who grew up in Aix with him. Those letters talk uh, 
sort of luminously and uh, gloriously about the times they spent swimming um, and mostly in the Ark River, which is a small river that flows beneath X just to the south and where Cezanne and Zola and their other boyhood friends spent a lot of time uh, as a young man. One of the reasons they, Cezanne, I think, was so interested in bathing and in water was because it is really hot in southern France. <laughs> this is a temperature gradient uh, sort of graph. And I, when I was there that summer, I finally, I said, I know why Cezanne was so interested in bathing. Because in July and August, it is blisteringly hot. And, you know, everybody kind of tries to find a way to cool down. And that's one of the ways in which uh, Cezanne did it. This is a very famous early bathing uh, painting called Bathers at Rest. This painting was done in 1876. Now just think about that. This is a very radical sort of image. Uh, you can see the ways in which people like Picasso could have looked at this painting and found a kind of a model, a sort of a template for a departure from classical uh, painting. But this painting is so early in, in, in that century and so radical. And this is one of the reasons that Cezanne was not well understood. Uh, people could, just couldn't understand what he was doing uh, with this kind of, of approach to bodies, to, to, uh, to landscape. Um, this painting, by the way, is at the Barnes in Philadelphia. So if you ever get to Philadelphia, it's got the greatest uh, Cezanne collection uh, probably in the world. But there are many other beautiful sort of lyrical um, approaches to bathing that Cezanne painted uh, almost across his entire life. It was a motif, it was a theme that he never moved away from. This is one of the, the large bathers. This is a huge painting uh, that's now in London. Uh, also very radical in its the way it treats the human body, the human form. Um, and I went in search of the sites where he actually might have thought about painting these things. And one of them is this bridge called the Pont des Trois Sautés, uh, which is uh, an image that he actually painted a number of times. And here's the bridge. This bridge is still uh, spanning the Ark River. It's a, it's a, I don't know how old it is. I mean, I used to know, I don't remember now, but it's really old. And cars still actually go across this bridge. Um, and the day that we were here, they also have a representation of some of the images that Cezanne painted of this bridge. And these are a couple of them. And this is the river today. This is the Ark River. Now, I wouldn't go swimming in this. <laughs> I don't know about you. So something's happened, right, between when Cezanne was going there and swimming and now. And one of the things that's happened is that all of these watersheds have become enormously polluted. And I've read some articles, actually, about the pollution in the Ark River. But here, too, development has overtaken these pastoral sites where he painted. This is the auto route that goes right by this site. And this is the um, Arc-en-Ciel campground. So you can camp uh, right there on the Arc. I would not want to do that either. Across the street is the Bal des trois Sautés. Across from there is the auto uh, uh, instruction school where you can learn how to drive and of course the tattoo parlor. So again, one of my interests in this book is these time then, time now, the way these landscapes have changed uh, in times and Cezanne's. Uh, painting. Cezanne was born in X. Uh, he was born in this house. You can tell from this house that Cezanne was not born into modest circumstances. His father was a hattier and later a banker, a man of some means uh, as his life went on. Uh, good thing for Cezanne because Cezanne never worked and a uh, good thing for us because he was able to paint. Uh, but this is where he was born and X is a beautiful, how many people here have been to X? X is a beautiful uh, uh, city with these beautiful uh, buildings and residences. Uh, this is the Musée Granet, where um, Cezanne learned to paint. This is the uh, author here <laughs> in front of the Musée Granet. But it's a very impressive city, and it would have been even more impressive uh, at that time in the 19th century uh, when Cezanne was living there, because it was really the capital of Provence uh, in, in many ways. And it had been a very important provincial capital uh, over the years. 
This is the house that Cezanne principally grew up in. This is called the Jardin Buffon. His father purchased this when Cezanne was quite young. And at the time of the purchase, it was outside of, outside of X, but um, it was a very impressive um, place, a beautiful place, uh, partly now owned by the state and uh, coming, to, uh, coming to into a kind of a preservation finally, I think, though there's still some ways to go. This is an early image of, of, of a Cezanne painting of the Jade Buffon. And this was the site of many very interesting landscapes that he did uh, during his life. This is a particularly beautiful one of this pool. Uh, and this is, again, during his Impressionist period. Um, so uh, that was an important uh, passage in his life, living in that place. This is the house in which Cezanne lived at the end of his life and where he, in fact, died um, in 1906, and from which uh, he walked almost every day in this last sort of decade of his life to this studio that he built above X. This is called Le Love. The people here live to Le Love. Uh, fabulous place. This is right after it was built. Cezanne designed it. He paid for it. This is after his father has died. Cezanne is now... 60, late 50s, early 60s. And this is where he does some of his greatest last works. This is a really beautiful and very abstract view of the garden at Lelo outside of the uh, patio, right outside of this door, actually, which is the door into the studio. And this is a, I didn't take this picture, but this was available on the web. This is the inside of the studio where he did so, so much of his great late painting. Of course, one of the things he's famous for, and you have seen many of these images probably, are these still lifes. And Cezanne arranged these still lifes in this studio and painted these absolutely ravishing uh, still lifes for which he is so famous. Uh, and here he is, uh, again, very close to the end of his life in 1904, I think, in front of another one of the great bathers. Uh, this bathers, uh, also quite large, as you can see, is also at the Barnes. I think it's one of the great paintings. Uh, in the history of, of French painting. And there he is uh, sitting in front of it. He worked on this painting for five years. You remember Merleau Ponty says, it talks about how many times Cezanne would go over these paintings. This painting he worked on for five years and it still wasn't done. There it is. This is the image of the painting at the Barnes. Again, very radical for the time. Very hard for people to understand this. That's the reason people didn't understand it. But if you again look at some of these shapes and the renderings of the body, you can see kind of Picasso, how Picasso could emerge from this the treatment of the human body. In addition to X and nearby, the other great motif uh, natural site for his painting is, is of course, Mont saint -Victor. And this is an image uh, uh, that I made of the, uh, this is a photograph I made of, of the mountain. Uh, and this is another that I started with. This is from the site above Le Love, his studio where he painted some of these great uh, la late landscapes. And here's an image, a famous photograph of Cezanne, actually at this site, uh, painting. And there are some actual uh, descriptions of this in, in a book uh, of some uh, other painters who came to visit uh, Cezanne and actually took this picture. And here's another one of these late, um, images of Mount saint from that from that motif. Here's yet another one. Some of these are quite dark. Um, some of them are quite luminous. This beautiful watercolor um, that is, is at the same site and has completely different tone and mood. This is an earlier uh, painting, not from that site of Mount saint down closer to Le Tolone. And so on, this, there are many of these images in Cezanne's repertoire, and each one is extraordinary in some way. Uh, this is an image both of Mont saint and the famous Chateau Noir, which I'll come back to in a minute. Uh, Cezanne was a walker. He walked, I told you, he walked from Fortre Aix to Les Stock to escape the draft. That's about 30 miles, but he walked of course, into the motif to do his painting. And he was one of the first 
painters to really paint outdoors in this way. We can sort of take it for granted that people paint outdoors, but in the classical tradition from which Cezanne emerged, people didn't paint outside very much. And it was one of the gifts of the Impressionists and of the post-Impressionists like Cezanne to uh, paint outdoors. This countryside through which he walked is extremely rugged and difficult to walk in. So I had great respect after walking around here uh, how uh, tough Cezanne must have been to walk up into these sort of wild remote areas. Uh, this is a, in a part of the district around the Ptolemy called Les Enfernes. It's hot, it's rugged, it's steep, it's very difficult, but very traumatic and beautiful uh, terrain. These are all images that I took uh, during that summer. All Sandic Tuara is made of limestone, principally. This is very near the summit of the mountain. This is me at the summit of the mountain. So uh, that too is a very extraordinarily important sort of uh, site of much of his work and one of the themes, uh, one of the perpetual themes of his work. Uh, the village of La Talone is about six kilometers from X to the east. And it is also uh, a beautiful, uh, just a beautiful place. Uh, I was fascinated by the forms and the rocks and Cezanne picks these up in a lot of his painting. And you can see, you know, what he was looking at and how he was inspired to try to capture these um, natural settings. One of the most famous series he did was in the old Roman quarry at Bibemis, and it was at this site and in this house where he lived for on and off for a couple of years in the 1890s where he did some extraordinary painting. Uh, I took a tour of this um, this quarry with my camera, and I took a lot of pictures, and then have included here some of the uh, paintings that come from this extraordinary site. So this is an actual, if you like this, this is an actual place, obviously, and this is the place where that that painting was was done. <coughs> <laughs> he obviously was standing in a slightly different place, but it's pretty close. So it's it's fun tramping around in these places because you can actually see what he was looking, like, which I found incredibly inspiring. But I love these I love these paintings. They're um, they're mature paintings, that, but they have a lot of you know they have a lot of life and. Uh, the color, the coloration is beautiful. By the way, slides don't get these colors. I mean, right? These are sort of poor approximations. One of the one of the sites in in Le Talone that's very famous and led to the uh, another, another series is is a place called Chateau Noir. This was a place above Le Talone where Cezanne also stayed periodically in the in the later years of the of the eight, 1890s, and he uh, painted from an at or to uh, Chateau Noir. This is a picture of it. It's very hard to get close to. But this is from the road down below. And this is the painting, by the way. It's upstairs. So if you have um, any inspiration following this to go, go see some Cezanne canvases, this is one of the great images of Mont saint Victoire, painted on the road to Le Talonnet from X. And this is right here. In Cleveland, I think this is one of the best landscapes he ever did. The colors again here aren't quite true. This painting from this almost the same place is the Detroit Institute of the Arts, um, where I grew up actually uh, looking at art. And you can see um, what he did. Now this is not Cezanne. People know the painter Marston Hartley. Marston Hartley, a great American painter. Uh, this was painted in 1925, but think about these. Right? Hartley loved Cezanne, uh, was influenced by Cezanne, and he painted these exact spaces um, in, a, in a, you know, a kind of a Cezanne on steroids, but uh, very much inspired, obviously, by Cezanne's work. 
Merleau-Ponty went to Le Talonnet in the summer of 1960, as I said, and he wrote this beautiful essay, which I urge upon you, called I and Mine. Um, it's not a simple uh, essay, but it's a beautiful uh, piece of work. I actually found the house that he stayed in, uh, in uh, Le Talonnet, called La Bertrande. Uh, I was too timid to go knock on the door. And my wife was very disappointed that I wasn't able to do that. But this all comes together for me in the presence of Merleau Ponty in this place, so influenced and inspired by Cezanne. And I'm sure that's why he went there in the summer of 1960 to write. Uh, Merleau Ponty died, as I said, in 1961. This is, a, this is his grave uh, in the very famous cemetery in Paris called Père Lachaise. Has anybody visited Père Lachaise? So it's, it's a great, great thing to do. Some of the most famous uh, cultural figures and political figures in French history at Père Lachaise. And he's there too with his wife um, and um, his mother. Um, a very simple, elegant grave. This is Cezanne's grave uh, in Aix. And you can see off in the distance, Mont saint Victoire. And I'm sure that his son and his wife uh, were conscious of this when they chose this spot uh, for him to finally come to rest. And that's the end. And those are the landscapes of Cezanne and Colosse. Thank you. We have some time to talk. Be happy to talk about any of this or the or the essay that you read. Yeah. Have you ever painted a and so is that a different lens? And secondly, what do you think about you know it's hard for a painter to know when something's finished? Did you feel he had angst over that? I think yeah. something that come from that. I think he had angst about everything. And I think Merleau Ponty gets it right in that essay that he was he was enormously agitated all of the time. And what's so moving to me about the, his letters, and Merleau Ponty quotes this letter in the essay, where Cezanne, I think it was in 1904, wrote this letter where he said, I think I'm making progress. And so he had this vision in his mind of what he wanted to do, which he described as painting his sensations. Different than impressions. I mean, I think there's a, a subtle but real difference there. Um, painting his sensations. And it was as if he could never quite get it right. So he kept painting and painting and painting and painting. And sometimes that meant leaving canvases unfinished. Sometimes it meant overpainting. The, the big bathers that's at the barns, I think they've looked at it through you know, these special light analyses and, and surface analyses uh, instruments, and they can see that it was painted over five, six, seven times. Uh, so everything was unfinished for him because the bigger project was in some sense unfinished. Mercifully, I have never painted uh, because you wouldn't want to see what, what I would produce. But, but here's something I think. I think writing, and Peter may have some thoughts on this, I think writing is a lot like painting in some ways, in that you work by way of approximations to a more and more perfect expression of what you mean to say. And so writers notoriously are, you know, scratching out. Now we use the computer, so we don't scratch out. We just erase and go back and go over and over and over. And, and I find that writing is very similar to painting in that one. And it's been helpful for me to, to um, read Cezanne's descriptions of his process because they, 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 I think they're very similar to other artistic processes, which are these successive iterations of, of, of things. What is known about his existing paintings where they're probably lost? Do you know something about that? There are something like, there were, as best we can tell, because he was very careless with his paintings. Um, you know, he, he painted a huge amount. So there were seven or 800 canvases. There's a whole body of works on paper. You saw that beautiful watercolor 
There are sketchbooks that mostly reside here in the United States at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, um, which I've actually seen. There's a couple of sketchbooks that he kept and he just kept doodling. So there's a massive amount of work, but much of it was lost. Um, he, I don't know, he just would throw canvases out the window. He would abandon them and they would sort of disappear. Some of them must have been beautiful and, and, and very important. So there's a lot lost, but there's still a lot intact. And much of it is here in the United States. Barnes has a great collection. Philadelphia Museum has a great collection. The National Gallery has a very good collection. Uh, the Met has a collection. MoMA has a collection. There's a very good collection in Paris, obviously. Um, I don't think people worry that things were ripped off or lost along the way after he died. I think what people worry mostly about is what was lost during his life, which was significant. Petey. Was Bizarro an influence on him? Huge influence. So Cezanne was very close to Pizarro. Uh, he met Pizarro in in the 18, late 1860s, I believe, and he actually painted with Pizarro. There's a, there's a wonderful picture, I don't have a, a copy of it, where he is at Pizarro's residence north of Paris in Medellin, and uh, they would go out into the countryside and paint together. Pizarro was older. Uh, Pizarro was also a uh, a political radical and had very strongly um, uh, radical political views. I, I don't think that in, uh, interested Cezanne very much, but he was kind of a crusty, crusty guy, but he loved Cezanne and he believed in it. And there were very few people that did. So Pizarro occupies a huge uh, part of his psyche uh, because there were so few people that believed that what Cezanne was doing mattered. But Pizarro saw it, could see it. And some of, uh, I didn't show you images, but some of the earlier work, 1870s, 1880s, the impressionistic stuff, particularly, you can see Pizarro's influence. It's very clear. And I think there's an influence all the way. But uh, they were very close in a kind of mentor-mentee. No. No. Cezanne does get very abstract. You can tell in those images. Um, and abstraction is one of his legacies to, to later painting. Um, but Pizarro always remains pretty tightly, I think, figurative uh, in, in most ways. I'm not a Pizarro, I'm not a scholar at all of this stuff, but I don't know a lot about Pizarro beyond what I'm sure. Yeah? Was I your appreciation of uh, French civilization colored by the... Uh no, I can't say that these, well, yes and no, in, 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 this, in the following sense. Um, you know, the, the French experience post-World War II, which formed really the thinking of Sartre and Merleau-Ponty and some other very important Camus, uh, and some, that whole group of people, the war is what really molded them and, and shaped their philosophies in a very powerful way. Of course, the French were involved in Vietnam, and when Merleau-Ponty was in his prime in the 1950s, the Vietnam War, as a French war, was very much in the political spotlight in France. So it had a huge influence on the way those thinkers thought about politics and French politics in particular. And it was, all, of course, all part of the Cold War. The way this resonates for me, and I think for Peter, is that in my own coming home from Vietnam, one of the reasons Merleau-Ponty resonated so hard and so much with me was because he was writing about the experience of the post-war world and the sense of urgency that that gave him and the, 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 the pressure that everybody in that post-World War II world felt. I mean, they'd been through a, a cataclysmic event. I mean, the, the end of the world in a certain way. Did you use that in your cards over Oh, yeah. Oh, you mean in Vietnam? Yeah. No, I didn't have any French in Vietnam. I had a little bit of Vietnamese and some, and English, of course. <laughs> I did, 
I said merci a couple of times. Uh, Peter and I did meet a lot of people who were quite fluent in French. I don't, yeah. I don't be the means. I don't think that's as true anymore. I mean, generationally, you know, things have changed a lot. Um, but, but the post-war world in France, World War II, and the post-war world here, post-Vietnam, are, are, you know, they have a kind of uh, resonance. Uh, with one another, certainly in my mind. And I think that's why Merleau Ponty spoke so powerfully to me when I first read it. Petey. Sure. <laughs> so phenomenology uh, in, in its essence is a sort of a philosophical call to return to experience generally, and particularly to uh, phenomena, that is to say the way we experience the world in ordinary life, the way the world presents itself to us, against the background of various kinds of arguments about both knowledge and what knowledge is and what the world is, and also um, what truth is. And Husserl, who was the inventor of phenomenology, German philosopher, very heavily influenced Merleau-Ponty and Sartre in that whole generation, had a, a, a sort of a slogan, he said, back to the things themselves. In other words, get back to the way we experience the world, have the world, and, and Merleau-Ponty likes to talk about the primordial experience of the world. That's why he was so interested in painting because he, he understood that painters were looking, particularly Cezanne, looking and trying, as he says in that essay, to understand how the world touches us. So phenomenologists are uh, sort of doing away with uh, anything that doesn't speak to and about our immediate experience of the world, and that um, attempts to explain away or uh, to do without the way we experience the world. So appearances, Merleau-Ponty was very interested in perception. And you can see from that why he would be interested in painting. So it's really that, that return to experience and the ground of experience and the way the world, the way we uh, know the world in the, in the detail, the mundane detail of our experience. Does that help? So when Cezanne says that um, he wants to experience the landscape and make it capture this consciousness that we talked about. Yeah. Well, I, he didn't know he didn't know anything about phenomenology. Oh, no, but but the way he talked about what he was trying to do to um, to understand the way the world presented itself to him and how it comes to be the visual world that we have. Um, I, I think that's why Marilyn Ponty was so interested in them. There was a question somewhere. Yes. Yeah, question about it. I think in that phenomenon, I'm struck that the way that Cezanne talks about the landscape and the landscape is that it's not really That's right. That, That's absolutely right. Um, and which makes a lot of sense to me, and, and I realized that he was one of the first of the hair painters. But I mean, that immersion in the actual place that he's trying to kind of tap into in some spiritual like And I think there really is a spiritual element of it, um, to it, um, in both in the way that Cezanne speaks about um, the landscape and trying to see it. In its, in its fullness, and certainly the way that Merleau-Ponty talks about um, getting back in touch with that fundamental primordial experience of the world that we have because we have bodies and because we're embodied in 
in the visible world and how that miracle happens. There is a, a kind of a spiritual element about that. And do you see the kind of this fascination with faith and the naked nature of this? Uh, you can see the draw between those two. Oh yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's very powerful. I mean, I think that that uh, his fascination with all these dimensions of landscape uh, leads you in that in, into that same direction. I, it's also true of his of his uh, still lives. I mean, the still lives for him were just another expression of nature. So he was trying to. Understand the way those those experiences also present themselves to us, and uh, as Merleau Ponty says, he wasn't so interested in the exactitude of it. And indeed, he's famous for his deformations, and his odd sort of spatial expressions. But it's really more about the experience of it and trying to understand that that level of it that you're describing. John. Yeah. No, Meloponti led me to Cezanne, I have to say. Uh, and, and it really happened kind of late. I mean, I, I was interested in his views on painting. I wrote my dissertation on Meloponti, so this is like 40 years ago. And uh, it wasn't until I became sort of uh, accidentally exposed to art when I was at Colby. There was a very good museum there. I was very involved in the museum. And I just got really, I, I remembered this obsession of Merleau Pontis with Cezanne with painting. And then it all made sense to me. So it's kind of a way for me to re understand Merleau Pontis' philosophy through Cezanne and through painting. Um, and also these landscapes, which I think are very powerful and uh, fantastic to, to be in. So I'll be going back to France a lot. <laughs> Lucky me. Yes. Yeah, but don't. Don't miss that Cezanne upstairs. <laughs> um, it's, it's a peach. Thank you all very much.